beautiful co-creators, Lilou here. I'm in Switzerland, in Lausanne, with Philippe. Hello. Hello, welcome. <laughs> Thank you for doing this interview in English. This is not our first language, but this is juicy. We just done this interview in, in English, and I really, really enjoyed your presence. And thanks to your wife, we got together here. How fantastic. Yeah, thank you for coming all the way. Because we stayed here and you came to us, which uh, should have been the contrary. Oh, this is my pleasure to travel right now around Europe and show to everybody around the world what's going on on a global scale. And your story I find fascinating because um, you were in the in the petrol in a in a uh, you're going to explain that, but you were big boss, and then uh, now you're uh, a big boss, but in a different way, not big boss, just uh, just doing your healing work uh, and around the world, and I and and I find that fascinating. So, tell us about what happened to you and how you got here. Well, uh, I didn't choose anything. In fact, I should say I was pretty stubborn. And I was raised as an engineer. I work in the old business in a well-known company called Schlumberger. In fact, a subsidiary of Schlumberger called Dowell uh, Schlumberger. And I've been sent on rigs uh, offshore. Uh, and I was in what they call wildcat areas. So it's really the first well you drill. So there are all the danger. We don't know the place. We're trying to find out what it is and everything. But it was all about excitement and a notion of freedom, even though we're in the jungle, because uh, <laughs> I did the pampa, the jungle, uh, la savanna, everything, uh, but never in a town or a city. Then, uh, after almost 10 years, I quit. I went for an MBA in Fontainebleau, in, uh, we call in Seade. And I enter Chase Manhattan Investment Bank, which uh, I have to say was not my cup of tea. Uh, it didn't fit at all with the environment, and I was not happy uh, with what I was seeing inside. Uh, so instead, I started to act as what they call a troubleshooter to restore uh, hailing companies all over the world. So it took me again in Africa, in Europe, uh, in Middle East. And finally, I ended up in New Caledonia in the middle of uh, the Pacific Ocean, which was uh, could not go any further from my hometown and of Paris. And then one day I said to myself, what are you escaping? I had no answer so far, but I knew there was something here. And so I came back uh, to Paris, and um, and then something happened uh, just before the turn of the century, where I was with a friend of mine, and we went here in Switzerland. So there's something for me with Switzerland. And uh, we were in the garden, and she raised her hand, and uh, she broke her leg, which I stayed, you know, I was not flabbergasted. I was petrified, uh, will be more exact. And uh, so I helped her. I called the ambulance. Uh, I took her to the hospital. I stayed with her while they work on her. And they said, tomorrow, come at 11, uh, the surgery will be done. I could not sleep, obviously. I said, there's something wrong. Here. There's something that I cannot figure out. It's... And I was there, so, and I still have uh, the noise of this, uh, like a dry wood breaking in, in her. So I asked the surgeon when he came out of the operating room, and I said, doctor, I need to understand something. She raised her hand and she broke her leg. I mean, you should have seen the face <laughs> of the surgeon. He said, listen, young man. Well, that's, that's the only time. <laughs> and he said, listen, young man. A few months ago, I operated the Formula One driver, Michael Schumacher. He had the same thing, but he admitted he was over 200 km an hour in his Ferrari and he, he ran into a wall. So I don't believe what you said. But I tell you something. I'm not interested in relationships and what's happening between couples. And I say, but I'm not even dating her. I have nothing to see. She's just a longtime friend from uh, childhood almost. He said, okay, okay. Right then. And then he went back in and he saw Sophie and uh, she was coming out of narcos. He said, what happened to you? He said, I don't understand, doctor. I raised my hand, my leg broke. He said, well, the two of you, <laughs> pretty weird. Uh, 
I'll put it the, what they call uh, fracture, fatigue fracture, which I don't exactly what it means, but it was the word they used. And from that moment on, uh, I felt I was on an automatic driving and I was not controlling anything in my life, mm. which went through uh, the failure of the company uh, I was, which was just because my partner stole the money. I mean, uh, then I went to... The which was which was pronounced by a medium yeah. friend of yours, yeah. which is that same uh, friend? My friend who, who broke her leg went to the United States to stay in Miami with her sister to just because she has six months to recover. And then she saw a medium there who told her, but you're not going to be a dentist anymore. What you're going to be is something else. And uh, I guess that had to do with energy. So she applied for a different school and uh, finally went to Delphi University in, in uh, north of Atlanta in Georgia, where she started the program to become a medium to learn how to tr be trained and, and to master uh, psychic uh, abilities and after a while she called me in Paris said Philippe I check on you and uh, your best friend is uh, stealing the money from the company I said oh, come on I mean, there's no sense uh, try a bit more train and then call me back <laughs> which she did a month after and told me again Philippe I'm serious you should check And I check, I asked my uh, partner who was in charge of accounting and finance, and he said, no, look, everything is all right. And two months later, he said, I don't understand, something must be wrong, there's no money. And then I knew. And what happened was the most difficult, it was not only the betrayal, but my friend told me, please, don't sue him, it's your chance. Uh, I was losing one million euros, and it's not... Yeah. something you lose just like that it was all my savings all the money I had made in those uh, 20 past years or so and at least the equivalent of today <coughs> and she said no trust me I said, I trust you mm -hmm. but then I got an offer to go and start uh, to work in New York I started the company but six weeks after uh They said, you're too expensive as an expatriate and it's going to be too difficult. We're going to hire someone from uh, Harvard. They do as well and uh, it's cheaper. So I was laid back flat like that. Uh, thank you. Goodbye. And I called my friend who was at the school in, uh, in McKaysville, uh, Georgia. And she said, why don't you come and see me? And I came and she said, the next course coming in two days, it's time for you to join. And I did. But you, but you must have thought you were going uh, mad, or not? I mean, so many things were were going on at the time. Were you? Was it like a spiral down for you, or you were you were having more and more hope? Because it feels like some people really have a have a hard time when all these these things when you're out of control for an engineer. I mean, it's quite something. It is quite something. As long as I remember the word, I was lost. I mean, I could not understand what was going on and why. And, you know, the first reflex said, what did I do wrong? Yeah. And that is a completely silly question. But in those days, it sounded the most brilliant question I could ask myself. And uh, But I was lucky because this friend, uh, being a very good friend, uh, gave me a healing. And she said, trust and uh, give it at least 10 days. And in those 10 days, I tell you, being a scientific raised as an engineer to see this guy I see this I sense that and I talk to that I, <laughs> I would say oh my god I hope nobody knows where I am you know not one from my family not my friend who are investment bankers or whatever would know and at the same time I was trained uh, to be a medium because I, I did the, the first what they call the boot camp the first 10 or 15 days And I tell you, the day I had to give my first reading to someone I've never seen, I prayed inside and said, please, that nobody ever uh, will ever find out that I was there. So I was torn apart because my mentor was trying to tell me, Philip, it's, it's completely crazy. I mean, it has no sense. It doesn't lead anywhere. Uh, and something inside, it's... I could not even defy what was telling me, don't worry. And I dared to listen to it. And thanks to my best friend who was, was there 
for already one year and uh, she had done the first year of the school which lasts about three years and could lead me, explain to me, be patient and her quality of presence was just wonderful and nurturing. And and I thank her for that. Mm. And so then how did that transform in, in, in healing uh, uh, people? Well, uh, you know, at Delphi, you may know at Delphi, uh, you have a doctorate in metaphysics to understand a few things which are beyond physics. Meta in Greek means beyond, which is not physical, which is going around you that you may sense or you may react to and you don't even know why. <clears throat> so it was first the understanding of all that. And second, we had a doctorate in a transpersonal uh, psychotherapy where you have to use mm -hmm. your intuition in order to feel, and that was the most difficult for me. I had locked my feelings, or I would use them into mathematics to find the answer to an equation, then I would feel free. But I was very afraid of emotions, you know. I was commitment phobic, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I've been through. No, no, I was, I was there, you know. Because I see, I'm laughing because I see him happily married and loving the commitment thing. It's no issue right now, and there's so much love. I saw it. It's, it's, it's wonderful. So it's 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 really. It feels like it's another life time ago. <laughs> it is because when I change my energy, my perceptions, my identifications, my dogmas, my creeds, my certainties, and all that. And then I realized life was easier and was joyful. Mm -hmm. And this is what was missing in my life. And um, I'll tell you an example later, if you, if you want, with a story when I listened to Greg Brad and his, his DVD. Uh, so I was there and I was feeling there was something else, like suddenly I could feel things. I never seen a rose, I mean, I would come by, but never, you know, slow down and smell the roses. I was unable because uh, I was more into excitement. And in those days, I didn't know that excitement, you're playing with adrenaline, which is fear of death in the unconscious mind. And so you're disturbing the way your kidneys are working. And kidneys is a balance in your body. And when I see all these people, all about excitement, I go faster with my car, or I play poker, I take risk or uh, I go buggy jumping. What the point to jump from uh, a crane or whatever in order to have adrenaline? If they knew what they do to their body, they would stop right away. But in those days, I was like them, so I can understand them. I was no better. I was driving Porsche car. I was doing all these things. I had, uh, any single man who was uh, earning a lot of money would do, especially when you are offshore for 20 years. So there I understood that joy was more powerful than any pleasure in the world. And that was priceless. And the point was how to awaken this joy, how to, to feel it, to nurture it, to stay in it, you know. And then I understood that life is about the quality of presence. It's not about what you know, even though it seems interesting, but it's more in the way you say it in the way you will express it and the energy behind. You know, if you still want to show off, it's boring. <laughs> and unfortunately, I was there uh, in those days. So uh, it took me three years, but there's so many information that it took another three to four years just to settle, to, to really go inside, to get it. it it's very powerful and... Uh, and the raw earn uh, techniques are very, very powerful because at the end you have you break the constructs in the head. So all the automatic responses that you have registered before and that stored and, and in order to to step back and to stop reacting. So you go out of uh, impatience to go patient. So you, you step out of here to go there. It, it, it takes time. Uh, I mm -hmm. tell you, it was not easy and it was not in one day. Mm -hmm. But luckily, I met uh, Eliza, who, who was my wife today, and uh, she had strong psychic activities. She could feel and she could lean me because women are more intuitive in, in a way. Uh, they are much better intuitively, naturally at least. <coughs> 
And uh, we're better uh, once we have the intuition to uh, explain it, to put it into practice. So uh, you need both. So I was very lucky to have uh, next to me someone who could feel everything and would ask me for explanations. So that helped me a lot. And in fact, um, I had a few questions how it works why why these people come and see me and I do Reiki and uh, they feel better why me why that and why prayers are like so one day my wife <coughs> told me I don't know why I found uh, somewhere I saw a DVD of a guy I have no, never heard of Greg Braden and uh, it could be interesting for you because he's an engineer. Maybe you will understand. I said, Greg Redland, I read all his books. For sure I will. <laughs> and it was um, Science of Miracle or something like that. And there we were looking at it and suddenly I got it. It clicked in my mind because maybe because I'm an engineer, but I love the way he speaks. I love his passion. I love his enthusiasm. And enthusiasm comes from Greek. It means the divine in me is, is there acting constantly. And he was explaining uh, the different way of praying. And he was giving me one of the answers. And the other one I had within me, I knew it would be connected to joy. And so look at my wife. I said, you know, I'm almost 60 and I cannot find joy. I can find pleasure, excitement, whatever. And I said, I have to meditate to go back to it. But then we opened the door and our little uh, Italian ground jumped on us all excited, but all joyful. And I said, this is a joy. So I connected to the joy of my dog to reawaken within me what the feeling is. And then I knew that when you go through joy, you can bring miracles in your life and in others' life. So... Uh, if you want to reduce healing, at least the way I see it, the way I practice it, is first of all, I'm not really interested that I listen to what they have to say. I'm interested what is behind, is what is the connection to their soul. Are they ready to go back, to go over the fear of being vulnerable if I love, basically, to open to what is beautiful in me? And I don't say pretty, I say really beautiful. It's just something that within, that the other will sense, will get just by being next to me. Therefore, the quality of the energy that I send will make me be charismatic, will make me help the other. And the second thing is that you go away that it, you cannot do it because you know it's not you. It's the energy you're able to channel only if you trust that the divine can be at work through you. And uh, people like John of God, they have the face of a child and they trust and they do miracles every day. And he has up to 2,000 people a day. Yeah, you went there. Yeah. But myself, when I had uh, six people in a day, I'm exhausted because it shows me still my limitations. Because there's no way we cannot do what the others. You know, we all have a soul and every soul is beautiful. But some are more connected to it than others. And uh, I'm on my way and I realize every day that there's more to do. So to help, we don't heal people. We help them heal themselves. Meaning we tune into energy of healing. Everyone has his own technique. But anyway, we have to go through the heart. Because if you stay in the head, forget. Uh, you were talking in the French interview about John Vallo, Melchizedek, and you were interested in, in, in uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton, people that really enjoyed interviewing too, but this is part of your work? Yeah, I, I really am grateful to these people. Bruce Lipton for what he wrote and uh, how important it is the, when he explained, by example, the, how the two hemispheres works. And this one takes 20 million information a second and the other one 40. When you realize that, you don't believe anymore you control anything because you know this one goes 500,000 times faster and you don't know what he's saying all the time. And so it shows you <coughs> that you have to, to be back in that because everything is there. And John Valo Melchizedek, I'm thankful to him for what he wrote, and especially when he explained in Living in the Heart that the brain is polarized, meaning the information goes here, 
and this one analyze it. So if you there, you're polarized. You don't know what the other one is doing. So you take a lot of risks. That's why some people, they pray mentally, I want this, meaning I don't have it and I cannot believe. And the other one send the energy of poor me, of failure, of, uh, I don't know, something like that. And it's, does it 500 times thousand more, faster? So you take a lot of risks. So the only way is to go in the art. So to go in the art is quite easy when you're into healing because that's our nature. But the hardest thing is to stay in the heart 24-7. And if you knew how many failures I have a day, it should give hope to everybody in the world. <laughs> and that's the truth, you know. It is difficult because the one we love uh, is there as a mirror acting for us to show us our limitations, our irritation for stupid things. Everyone who's living uh, with someone knows that you can be irritated by things. And it has nothing to do with it. So then is our free will to go back into the heart, into oneness, meaning spirit, or the divine or infinite, or into separation, which is the ego, and it's pain. So we have each of us, at every second of our life, the choice to decide, should I look for joy or even bliss because I'm going to be in oneness no matter what has happened, or I go back into my ego to judge, to justify, to blame, to compare, and then it's guaranteed suffering. Mm. So at least we have to do it consciously. Said, okay, I'm ready for being slammed in the face, but in the meantime, I'm going to justify, I'm going to compare, and everything. And there is, uh, for me, a deep truth, uh, and it's a simple one. I believe that if you really want to help people heal, it has to be simple. What's mm -hmm. all? And everyone has this potential. Yeah, we're all healers. You, me, and all the others. Because from the moment we are present, doing it from the heart, it automatically heals. That's why most of the time I said to the person I'm interviewing, please, let's just be in this energy. The words are not that important. Exactly. The words introduce already a separation. Um, if you go back uh, at Didim and Plotinus, uh, let's say third uh, Plotin is uh, third century, they already brought this very notion, which is a notion of negative theolo theology or apophatic, uh, if you want technical terms, meaning that if you want to talk about God or the infinite or oneness. You cannot define what it is because you're already limiting. So you have a negative definition which says you can say what it is not. So it's immortal. It means it's not mortal. We don't know what it is, but say it doesn't die. It's infinite. So I cannot define it because it's infinite. It's indecible, ineffable. So it's non effari in Latin. So I cannot express what it is. So when you're into this oneness, you don't talk. That's why uh, you see that in music, uh, when Mozart said that he realized the most important thing between two notes is the silence in between. This is the same. Or when uh, ancient, or in India, for example, they say it's between the breath, the intake and the outtake, this moment is the moment where everything is possible. That's when the miracle takes place. It's the same. If you go in, when all potential is there, and you can decide because you're in your heart mm. and you know that the other is just a part of you. Then every time I'm helping someone to heal, I heal myself. This is the most wonderful thing mm. I could dream of. <coughs> and this is sad though. And when a mother takes her child and just send love and she gives healing, you know, and she's in a oneness. Uh, when you get out of oneness, you go into pain, a pain of separation. To love is to go to override the fear of separation. Whatever form it takes, abandonment, uh, humiliation, it doesn't matter whether it's emotional, physical, uh, uh, mental, even spiritual. Your face is not mine. Uh, it doesn't matter. You already go into pain. Mm. 
If you accept the other one as a different phase, but you can reunite because you go to the divine in it, it's fine. There's no pain because there's no fear of separation into oneness. Mm -hmm. You see that with uh, a woman who just has delivered a baby and she's uh, breastfeeding. She doesn't feel that this one is going to leave her, at least not now. So she can devote her life, her nights, uh, get tired. She doesn't care. She's in pure love. And the man says, I don't exist because between them there's something, I'm out of it. <laughs> All right? Meaning, energetically, I'm not part of it. Especi which is especially true because when you become a mother, you enter into the male energy of protection. That's why so many men are completely uh, not at ease with the first child because they feel they're rejected. It's not completely wrong. It's just that the woman goes into the male energy and uh, they are male energy, they don't know where to go. But they can always go into their female energy to feel the love for the child and uh, not everybody's ready to go. You know, men, they're afraid and uh, I'm vulnerable. We, if I love, is very uh, mental. Uh. Men are opening up so much around this world. There's 40% of men that watches these videos. I know that. And, uh, and, uh, and, I, and I see the, that men are opening up to their intuitive and feminine and it's, it, the world is transforming. Indeed, it's what this uh, century is about. But we have uh, 2,000 years <laughs> <laughs> in the background, and those ones, they come fast back. I tell you, uh, yeah. I, I can, at least I can see it with me. So now, imagine the child is eight and yell at the mother or say really terrible things. And the mother is ready to slam the child who runs for his life, but uh, falls down and hurts himself crying. The mother suddenly forget because the child needs her and she feels the one as is depending on her. She forget what he said two minutes ago. She goes back and takes the child in her arms, you see? So whether you're in separation or not, you can love or not love. At the moment your child tells you you're stupid or whatever, even worse, it's very difficult to say, I love you, my dear child, you know? <laughs> but the moment he's there and he said, Mom, I need you, then you feel your love opening. Mm. So here is to love and condition it, is uh, to try to be there. Yeah. Let's let's uh, let's summarize here uh, to to end this conversation. I could really go on for ages. Uh, how do you define a miracle? A miracle is a natural process that we all able to do because we all divine connected to the divine, to spiritus and the spirit, the breath of life. Uh, and uh, we can have very good example. You're going to say, how do we do miracles? But let them happen. Uh, the, if you take a woman, by example, who's pregnant, she doesn't control with her head the process, what's going on. But she just trusts in her heart that everything is going to be fine. She may have doubts at times, but she will trust. Therefore, she's going to deliver a miracle of 50,000 billion cells, uh, something like that, yeah, uh, working together in harmony, which is a miracle. But for us, it's normal. She's a woman. She has to do it. But what here, we have a very important lesson from life, which says she doesn't control, but she trusts. And those are the two things you need. If you control, you limit yourself to the few means you have. Uh, to, uh, if you trust that this part and even better, the divine on you will be at work, then you create a miracle. Just like that, and it happens every day. If you're ready for it. Yeah. If you're ready. Thank you, Philippe, for this delicious, juicy conversation. Consciousness goes juicy. Thank you so very much for coming, and I'm honored that you came here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we send you much love from uh, Lausanne in Switzerland. Bye-bye, my delicious co-creators. Be open to those beautiful miracles happening around you every day. Thank you. Thank you. Just thank you. Thank them. you. And accept them. Yeah. Seize them and accept them. Thank you, Philippe. Much love. Bye. Bye.